Hey everyone, it's James Black, your host for the Exchange for Entrepreneurs podcast. And today I'm thrilled to be joined by my friend, Jay Martin, President and CEO of uh, Cambridge House International. And it's funny, just before this call, we talked about family legacy. Cambridge House obviously was uh, the brainchild of your father, but you've gone and taken it in so many different new and exciting directions uh, under your tenure. And what I really want to ask is um, when we last chatted on this podcast, we were in the midst of COVID. You couldn't have physical conferences, investor conferences. And what mm. I really want to know is, um, you know, after everything you've learned, relearned, done since uh, COVID, you know, Cambridge House is now back in a big way. I saw the growth numbers uh, from last year, the, this year for registration, 105%. It's probably much higher mm. now. Um, tell me why physical conferences, why Cambridge House specifically um, can't be killed, why, why it needs to mm. exist. Uh, well, first and foremost, you know, it wasn't an easy decision to go back to live events. You know, when we got shut down back in the spring of 2020, as any event production company did, it was tough. It was scary. You're like, what's our future? All of those questions. So many industries and business owners were asking those questions. We ended up landing on our feet with uh, sort of a, a media version of the event business. And truthfully, James, I got to keep my favorite parts. We, we just took what we used to do on stage and we started doing it from a studio and interviewing the same individuals and more. All of a sudden, you know, uh, individuals that didn't want to fly to Vancouver in January for a live conference were happy to hop on a call and record a podcast or a YouTube uh, show. And so it ended up actually expanding our reach. It simplified the business. It exited the parts that aren't so fun, like the operations and logistics and the production side of, of a conference. But we got to keep the content side, which is the most fun. And it's the part that I benefit from the most. You know, I'm, I'm an investor just like anybody who attends our events, who watches our, our shows. And so, you know, I'm a student in that role and I get to just interview people who have been in the game longer than I have. So when we had the green light to go back to events, it, it wasn't like an obvious Yes, let's go back right away because I was thinking, you know, we've found something better. Why would we go back? And a buddy of mine made a comment, actually, it's worth considering, you know, once we got the green light to go back to the old way of doing things, so many people rush back to the old way of doing things, even if it wasn't in their best interest. You know, we relearned smarter ways, more efficient ways to do much. And uh, that was the question I was trying to answer. So anyways, the reason we did go back and we've only gone back to one event thus far. You know, we used to have eight to 11 per year. I only chose to resurrect one. And the first reason was that I wanted to, right? It was like, I kind of miss the, the yeah. buzz. You know, I miss the live stage. I miss the crowd. You know, I miss the marketplace of companies and all the conversations that occur. So personally, I was driven to, to bring that back. And I do think that's the most important part because It'll determine how hard you throw your shoulder behind something, you know, if you, you personally want to back. So, so I knew I was lacking it. I knew I enjoyed the podcast, but I benefited more when I could sit down with somebody face to face and build a relationship and really learn from them and really understand their investment philosophy and thesis and all of this. And then, you know, it's the spec market, right? It's a, it's never going to be anything but a super high risk market. And I'm talking about the junior mining industry, which is what the VRIC is all about. And you know, you can you can restate this sentence uh, forever and it's still as relevant as the first time that it's all about the people like that's it. You know, you're not betting on on an industry. You're not betting on a, a product or a service. You're betting on the judgment and decision making and integrity of like one or two human beings. That's it. And, you know, whether or not they're going to do what they say they're going to do, whether or not they're going to go off and have an adventure with your money after you write that check. Like, do you trust this human being and do they surround themselves with other great people? And are they going to have a plan C when plan A and B fail? Because we know that's how this business goes. It's super tough. Right. And so having the opportunity, I think it does matter to see them in person, whether from the podium, you know, pitching a room of 50 or actually going to their booth and having a conversation it's important because it is a people driven business. Yeah. And I, I agree with you that physical space that you share with someone, um, a lot of things are happening, you know, not just like, uh, as you described, looking people in the eye, there's, there's actually like hormones and stuff. I mean, it's, it's hard to explain on a podcast, but, um, I've been to that show many, many times and I've been to lots of conferences we all have. And, and there's certainly just a human element that you can't replicate, uh, for all the good things you can do online, 
you just can't replicate in person. And I assume when you want to look at investment opportunities and be able to talk to the person that might use your money, um, there's no better way than doing it in person. So I think we've covered the magic of why people come back in person. But um, are, are there a couple of moments or a moment that stick out to you even from last year or that you're looking forward to this year that you think are going to be things you couldn't do virtually that have to only happen in person? Um, anything that comes to mind, whether it was a guest or a moment that uh, you already proved to you like, yes, this is why we're back. Oh, certainly. And you know, I have a direct <laughs> example because we did this show virtually in 2021. And yeah. one of our headline speakers was former Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Um, we then resurrected the live events in 2022, and I brought him on again as one of our headline speakers, both of which were interview style. So he had to sit down and I got to grill him for an hour. So that's a direct comparison. You know, one was from my home studio talking to Prime Minister Harper from his, you know, his home office. And the second was live on stage in front of a thousand people. And it's just a different energy. And you're right, whether it's the pheromones or just the, you know, the, the primal uh, desire to, you know, we're herd animals after all. But like, it's just a different, it's a different level of energy. The quality of the conversation is just better as a consequence. There's more nerves, which drives a higher performance and more preparation because you have that mix of excitement and fear that really, you know, makes you focus. And, um, and, uh, and James, like I've never seen an audience, I've been doing this 12 years. I've never seen an audience engage as much as they did last year in 2022. I mean, we had not even standing room available in our core speaker hall and that's rare, you know, it's rare. And I was like, what's, What's with the enthusiasm? Why are people so keen? I've never heard such loud applause. I've never heard people laugh so hard at jokes that were told on stage by various fund <laughs> managers. And it's like, I think it's just because this is novel. We haven't done this in a long time, right? We haven't gotten together in person in a long time. And it drives a different result for sure. Yeah. I, well, those moments aren't just a result of us being deprived of human connectivity. I mean, I remember uh, Alex Tapscott, uh, when he was starting to talk about blockchain and that event that we had or you mm -hmm. had an extraordinary future and yeah. the, the buzz and just everyone just trying to figure out what the hell was going on with this new technology. Well, this concept based on a somewhat new technology. That was, that was 2017, and, September, 2017, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> that was huh. like, that would never happen online. You couldn't recreate that. So, okay. Here's my next question. Cause you still publish a regular newsletter. It's something I read and it comes out what every week. Is it? Yes. Or most so weeks. Yeah. And so <laughs> A two two part question: Why why newsletter? Why do you put so much effort into newsletter as, as sort of a um, piece of content? And secondly, when people interact with yourself, the newsletter, Cambridge House, other than the concept of trying to make money uh, or at least get smarter about investing, what's the other promise or the other trail you're trying to take people down? So, two part question: Why newsletter? And then, other than making money, what are you trying to impart on people or, or exchange dialogue on? So I write the newsletter because everything else I do is conversation style, whereas the newsletter, I'm just talking to myself. And honestly, James, I just, I write the letter that I feel like I need to read. You know, there's a subject that I'm trying to grapple with, that I'm struggling with. And that can be something like philosophical, to be honest. I mean, you know, often I don't write about financial markets. Um, I write about, uh, you know, civil divisions and and the importance of discourse and, uh managing your expectations and managing your biases and heuristics because you know to your second question like you know what is investing really all about it's just about managing your psychology and preventing bad decisions like that's that's and those should be the top goals you know and and um because i interview so many very successful money managers and investors and entrepreneurs who have great track records and um none of them ever agree. You know, I could interview 10, 100 different money managers with who have had amazing success and ask them about their prediction for the next two years. They'll all tell me something different. So what does that mean, right? It means that no one really knows. Like no one has a clue what's around the corner. Um, and so I, I tend to stay away from that because there's enough people making forecasts and predictions. And, you know, we can do our best to tune into as many of those as possible and then kind of find whichever resonates with us. I tend to focus more on strategy, right? So how do you filter through all the noise and, and identify some kind of a signal? Um, there's so much stimulus trying to get your attention, trying to give you good ideas. You know, FOMO is super real. This deal's taken off. Why am, why am I not participating? Um, 
and investing super, super emotional. And so, you know, the content of my newsletter is often written to temper my own emotions, right? Again, it's like a letter that I need to read. <laughs> and, uh, and that's when I enjoy it the best. And honestly, when I get the best response from my audience is when I delete the audience from my mind when I'm writing it. And I'm like, I'm just journaling. And then I publish that. And that's when I enjoy it the most. That's when I get the best response. And I feel like it's when I do my best writing, truthfully. It's like therapeutic, to be honest, James, because it's like a... For sure. Uh, it's you, very you, personal. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So do you do you want people to follow you that are going to agree with you? Or do you want people who are going to follow you that disagree with you? Oh, I don't care. You know, it's like if... Uh, <laughs> If, um, well, okay, so, you know, a uh, topic that I revisit frequently is the ability to listen to somebody you disagree with and still pick out gems that resonate with you. It's really hard to do, you know, like if there's a headline that offends you or, you know, a book in the first chapter is like, I don't agree with that. It's hard to read the next 11 chapters and still give chapter eight credit. Be like, well, that one was valuable though, right? Like we're very quick to write off in an entire piece of content or speech because we hear something that offends us or something we disagree with or something we're like, that's just flat out wrong. And then we dismiss the rest of it when there's maybe some really useful stuff in there. And if for no other reason than to help you play devil's advocate against your own convictions, right, which is super, super important. So, you know, if people are reading and I know people disagree because I get those responses, too. Um, <laughs> you know, I hope I'm adding the kind of value that I get from um from listening to uh, opinions I think I disagree with, you know, or I, I feel like are just kind of short-sighted and, and, um, and narrow, you know, but um, it's, it's, uh, I think the whole concept of like healthy debate and civil discourse is one that we're, we need to hang on to really tightly right now because uh, maybe, you know, we're a bit easily, more easily triggered than we were 10 years ago or five years ago or four years ago. Like it's been a bit tense a few times in the last three years. And so, if we can cling to that, that's that, that civil, civil discourse. I mean, that's all like the ability to debate and to, uh, I think it's very, very important or else we just end up in these silos with, uh, you know, opinions that complement our own and deepen our own conviction, but massively amplify our blind spots. And we're the one who suffers in that scenario because we're not seeing the whole picture and we're just putting our blinders on and it's, it's important. It's very, very important. Oh, I, I agree. And I think that, well, when you're producing content, it does have to be entertaining to some degree. Um, but people, your viewers, listeners, watchers, readers, they have to uh, subscribe to some form of discomfort around. If I'm going to learn by going on this journey with Jay, I don't have to agree with everything, but I might actually see things a different way. And mm -hmm. that might make me you know, smarter about what I do. And um, hopefully that's that's where people land without getting offended or being terribly uh, turned off. Or, or if they decide, maybe my next question, you've had a ton of newsletter writers at your conferences. Um, you've, I'm sure you've read a lot of them, interviewed a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, as an investor yourself, how do you choose what kind of content and newsletter writers um, you're going to follow to uh, inform yourself and feed your mind with ideas for investing? Yeah, there's there's a few maybe like basic rules that I might point to, uh, and this is not a general rule, but one that should be uh, considered. Think about the brand of the author. I, I do I do this, you know, because we've seen. I mean, how many cycles have we watched, James, in the last ten years? Mm -hmm. Right, various um, whether it's cannabis, whether it's crypto, whether it's gold, like you know, they they come and go, right, and. And on the back of those cycles, a lot of authors and publications appear um, that are branded to that asset class, right? The crypto investor, the cannabis investor, the gold speculator. Like, you know, if the business model is paid subscriptions and the brand is tied to a specific asset, then it's in that author's best interest to keep you interested in that asset, whether or not the timing's good or not, right? It's not always a good time to invest in gold. It's not always a good time to invest in anything, right? And so... You know, I would just be wary of uh, authors that tie themselves to one specific thing and then rely upon the subscription revenues of you being interested in that specific thing. Because you might always, you might not always get the whole truth. And maybe it's not nefarious. It's probably not, right? It's just we are all subject to our own biases. And if you go deep yeah. down the cannabis or crypto rabbit hole, you're, you're going to see that, and and <laughs> and you might just get led astray. So, yeah, just just a light rule that I, I watch, and then. When it comes to uh, just 
finding authors, it's all about what resonates with you, right? Because you're only going to read it if you enjoy it. You're only going to read it every single week if you enjoy it. I mean, some of my favorite authors like Luke Groman, Grant Williams, their their letters are really long. You know, it's like a 50 page thing that comes out, you know, and how I got three kids, I got, you know, a business, like how am I supposed to find time to, you know, sit down and read four of those? You know what I mean? Like, it's really tough. And so if I don't love the writing, like if it doesn't resonate with me, um, then I'm just not going to not going to make the time and I'm not going to intake uh, the insights because I'm, I'm not really fully engaged, you know. And so I define authors that like you like their style. I think that's really important. And yeah. then if you can find two to take different sides of the same bet, you know, which is why I read Brent Johnson and Luke Groman. They are always feuding on Twitter. They rarely ever agree, but I think they're both really, really smart. I don't think uh, in terms of their sort of bets on the future of U.S. dollars, anybody knows who's going to be right, least of all them. But by listening to both, you know, you get the whole picture about, you know, why we should maybe consider staying along U.S. dollars. And to Luke's point, maybe why it's time to jump off that ship. And, you know, again, like I don't think anybody knows, but like so that would be another like it's got to resonate with me. And then if I can find two authors to take the uh, opposite sides of the same bet and that gives me a better perspective. Yeah, it's smart. We talked about on last week's show confirmation bias and trying to avoid it. And yes. that's 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 it right there. A uh, couple last quick questions. Um, so people were come to the show. Uh, what are what do you what do you sell on this? Or what are people expected to hear, see, feel? Um, maybe give us a tease as a topic that you think is going to reverberate uh, across the show floor this year. Okay, so the show's in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. So it's largely a Canadian audience, not entirely. So this year, I've invited two former premiers. So I've got the former premier of British Columbia, Christy Clark, and the former premier of Saskatchewan, Brad yep. Wall. And the reason is, is because there's a story occurring in Canada right now that I don't feel like many people are paying attention to, but I also feel like it's super, super significant. And this is on the back of provinces like Alberta and Saskatchewan putting forward legislation that is flies directly in the face of federal policy. Now, Alberta's got the Alberta Sovereignty Act. Saskatchewan's got the Saskatchewan First Act. And this legislation is built to give the provinces the power to defy federal decisions. That's at its simplest uh, explanation of what's occurring here. And, you know, federal media, you know, is largely, no, entirely shutting this down and writing articles to the tune of nobody wants this, these bills are dangerous. Um, no one wants this, least of all the residents of these provinces. But then, you know, the Saskatchewan First Act is voted in favor of unanimously with bipartisan support. So you tell me who doesn't want this, right? There's this battle occurring right now between the federal government and federal sponsored media and the provinces who are saying with louder and louder voices, yeah. the federal government is creeping too far into our business, right? Now, I've also sat down, I, I chatted with Christy Clark, Premier Christy Clark yesterday, because she'll be joined on stage with me. She feels the exact same way, by the way, as a liberal premier of British Columbia. She's probably feels even stronger than, than uh, former Premier Brad Wall, who I spoke to. Like there's a, there's a rumbling occurring here and across the country, um, there is massive um, discontent at how our federal policy is just not including the provinces in their decision making and largely hamstringing them um, in a variety of ways. So anyways, I love getting inside the psychology <laughs> of the um, of the, of our elected leaders. And so I'm sitting down with those two individuals. And then, you know, it's, it's largely about where's capital going? I mean, as an investor, what we want to do is spot the avalanche of money and get ourselves in front of it, right? That's the best uh, course of action. And so I'll be joined by um, investors who have continually spun out massive wins, right? Whether on the entrepreneurial side, like Ross Beattie will join me on stage for just a, a fireside chat. He's built 14 companies, delivered 14 10 baggers. Like he's the guy's the broken slot machine. So I want to know where he's putting his cash and what he's doing now. Uh, you know, Frank Justra, Rick Rule, Grant Williams, Brent Johnson, Lynette Zhang, like, uh, Danielle Park. I'm a huge fan of her contrarian views. And, um, and I just want to find out where's capital going, because if you listen to enough of these individuals, you know, they will all disagree, but you'll also find consensus in a few things. And that's where, the, you know, the strike point is, right? If, if, you, if you talk to 100 different money managers, they all have different theses, but they're all saying, but we're also all collectively going to increase our allocation to this thing, right? Whatever that thing is, that's the collective tsunami of capital that we want to get 
ourselves in front of. So, you know, mm-hmm. lots of stuff like that. Yeah. Last question. Why do billionaires, people who never have to work a single day in their life, like Frank Chustra, yeah. I assume, um, come back and do these things? Why do they, why do they put themselves out there? Uh, come back and do these things like come and speak at a, an event. Yeah. You know, I mean, what's, yeah. what's in it for them? I, I think there's some, some philanthropic, um, passions there. Like Frank is incredibly philanthropic. Uh, and, um, I believe honestly, James, you know, he, he does it for that reason. And I've, I've, um, he's been super generous with his time, uh, coming on the podcast a few times. And sometimes we talk shop about where he's putting cash, what companies he's investing in right now and, and all of this, where he sees the market going. And other times we talk about, you know, uh, what it was like to be locked in a hotel room when he almost lost Lionsgate Entertainment. Uh, he was hours away from losing the company because of a short-sighted decision he made in his inexperience at that time. And what it was like during the darkest hours of this legendary entrepreneur's life, right? Where he, you know, his back was against the wall because he, he was just, Yeah. He was inexperienced at the time, but he, you know, makes these massive bets, huge swings into all sorts of industries, whether it's food, entertainment, obviously mining. And, um, the guy is just, you know, so bold, uh, but gets himself in trouble as a consequence sometimes. And those are often <laughs> the most exciting stories, you know? Yeah. We, I mean, we had that theme on the show a couple of weeks ago too, Jay, just sort to interrupt, but entrepreneurs are almost addicted to that tension, right? Of, of, you know, the Elon Musk's and Mark Zuckerberg's of the world, not happy to sit on their laurels, but actually you know, use their positions to try to move the needle even further. So 100%. I think that's, that's, that's where they're at. Um, I've got more questions, which is a great time to not continue to ask them. If you know what I mean, <laughs> cause I want to bring you back and, and I want to have more of that, uh, idea generation. So, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to wish you a great show, Jay. I'm excited, uh, on your behalf. I won't be there, but a lot of our friends and, and some of my staff will be there. And, uh, I think it'll be an awesome time and certainly I'll see you hopefully next week. So, um, any parting thoughts or anything you want to share before we uh, we sign off for the show? No, I appreciate this, James. It's always fun chatting and catching up and uh, and uh, sharing old memories. Like, yeah, that was September <laughs> 2017 when we launched the Extraordinary Future Conference. And uh, yeah, what a rodeo that was. Fun times. Yeah, no, hopefully there'll be more. Okay, well, thanks for watching today. And uh, this is James Black. Subscribe wherever you watch or listen to our show. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks so much.